I'll take the question from the, uh, David Dye, who is, which is directed at Dr. Lindquist. On paper, science recognizes that indigenous cultures can contribute specially to the knowledge that supports management of natural resources and many other areas of science, of course. Yet there has been limited success from efforts to build paths for indigenous people to develop career, uh, careers in these areas. Is this a reflection that indigenous people don't really believe scientists value their knowledge and thus become an in, uninterested in those careers, a failure of trust, so to speak? Or is the message about this value not getting to indigenous peoples, a failure of communication? Or are there other things that it might be the result of, for example, institutional uh, failures? Or is it a little bit of each? Great question. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's really all of those things in and of itself. I mean, you could, you could dissect it by each of those responses and that, but the other aspect of it is um, our people, our cultural people, our cultural experts, and there are many, there are many who may or may not have academic credentials per se in that, but we know what our knowledge is. We, and we know it's science-based knowledge. And, and there, there's still the struggle of, okay, are we still trying to fit it into the great white norm and, and especially into those systems and silos? And then are people trying to take it from us and absurd that, you know, the, what it is and that. So it, it gets to be complicated, but, there is actually a lot more, I guess, movement. There's a lot more um, of our own trusting ourselves better, you know, and then protecting that knowledge and then using it internally with, at least within the tribal college world and tribal college system. And then particularly because of this pandemic that we're all living under the last 18 months, you see a greater explosion with the technology and within those markets, those media markets relative to how our younger people are sharing that and sharing that, that, that science-based information about who we are, what is it we know, how do we know what we know and, and where does it fit? You know, The other aspect of all of that truly is also um, our, our stories really tell us that we're gonna, the native people are going to be looked to, the red people of the world are gonna be looked to relative to the answers of the world surviving what we're living through right now. You know, it's, it's all about common sense application, which I truly believe is a science-based application of, of truth and knowledge and using things in a respectful way in a dignified way that befits all of us as human beings, but then mother nature also. So that was a, that's a great question and, and it's complicated. You know, it, it's very complicated and we tend to be protective of that, but there's also this great emergence of, of wanting to share. Dr. Castro, there are, there's a, a reasonably large number of native people in California uh, there are no tribal colleges in California. Uh, and so how uh, is Cal State, what's happening at Cal State in that regard? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, there's quite a lot happening uh, within our system as it relates to relationships with, uh, with tribes throughout California, even outside of California. But I would say Within California, we have a, a structure that includes um, uh, liaisons at each campus who get together on a system-wide basis to talk about overall strategy for our system uh, to increase uh, representation of uh, Native American students, faculty and staff, and building stronger relationships um, across California so you know, there's there's a lot of good work that's been done 
but I would like to do more in these coming years, make sure that our campuses have um, the strongest possible long-term relationships in place. And I, I don't view this as something that is going to happen overnight. It's going to take time to build trust in a lot of cases where there hasn't been enough engagement and, um, and to uh, find a mutually um, supportive path forward. Indeed. And finally, uh, not finally, but a question for all of you comes from Yaker Mazzoli. And I apologize if I got that uh, mispronounced. And this question is, as the only one in the room too often, how do you feel about that situation? This is a question that will resonate, I'm sure, with all of our panelists. And how do you keep on going? How about feelings of pressure, alienation, or fatigue? How did do you deal with lack of representation in your field? And why don't we start with you, Dr. Castro, and then we'll go to Kay and finally Cynthia. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, um, Kay, Kay did such a wonderful job of talking about her path and her mentors. We have a lot in common in that way. So I really appreciated that. I think for me, um, finding people um, who are supportive of me at different points in my life have really made such a powerful difference, um, beginning with my grandparents who raised me, but, but also uh, the faculty members and colleagues and friends along the way. And I continue to stay in very close touch with, with them. And I've tried to pay that forward by uh, being available to um, to students and faculty and staff colleagues, other presidents around the country who, or folks who aspire to be in that position. Just, I, I do feel a sense of responsibility to pay that forward. Um, and, and I do agree that sometimes uh, I, I felt isolated at times, but I try to, to make sure that I reach out and, uh, and have relationships that, that get me through those tough times. And, uh, Fortunately, with family and close friends from even before I was, uh, you know, a chancellor or president, that that helps. I have friends from when I was five years old, and I spent a lot of time with them too. So, it, you know, it's the combination of things. It's helped to keep me grounded. And uh, and I also wanted to mention there's some other programs around the country uh, that do great leadership development that I've been part of. Um, the Executive Leadership uh, Institute or Academy at UC Berkeley, um, and also um, Professor Mary Beth Gassman's uh, Emerging Leaders Program at Rutgers uh, University. And both of those really focus on uh, diverse uh, leadership in higher education. Thank you. Okay, Kay? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll give a then and now um, response. Um, Back in the day, um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and you know, I'm giving a talk um, to uh, folks in the Air Force, um, you know, Wright Pad Air Force, Pentagon, et cetera. They're in the room at MIT, and I get up to give my talk, and I look around, and yeah, I'm, I'm it. <laughs> and 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 the interesting, and there are many other circumstances, many other uh, times when this has happened. But I will say that each time I overprepare, I mean, I, I just had the pressure was such that it was always a matter of no room for error. Um, anticipate every question that could possibly come at you, have every, and let's just say that is what I, I'm describing that because I think that others may be nodding that I can't see because you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's how that feels. And you really do feel that there's a very slim margin for anything that's not accurate. And so that's how it was. Um, I still do that. But on the other hand, now today, I think about my, 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 um, my faculty who, because there are so few women or so few Latinas or so few of you know persons with disabilities, because there's so few, they get asked to do 10 things, 10 times more than anybody else. And so I also try to work on, I'm not, it, it, we're not there yet, but work on how do we, as Yonya Ma said, I think he said, be, make, make yourself redundant. 
And, and I had a, the former dean that used to say, you know, we have to make more of these because otherwise we find that our early career scientists, early career faculty are overextended because they are asked to be the one in the room a lot. And so I wanted to give them the before and, and now perspective because back in the day, it was the pressure that I felt to be just, you know, note the tales of that, of what I didn't know had to be really, really tiny. Um, and now today, my job is, as I said in my ghost statement, is to try to be sure that others do not have to face that. We're not there yet, We're not, but that is something that's present of mine. Thank you. Cynthia. Yeah, well, it was actually like, a week or two ago, I kind of lost in my time where I'm like, you have to take the moment to, um, when it occurs, when, when you know you need to put people in their place, and I hate to say it that way, but how do you do that in a good way? And how do you do that in an educational way? And unfortunately, in my world, it happens too often still today, you know, where well, why should we help you? Why should we help the Indians? You know, you get all that money from the federal government. And, and so the, the, the stereotypes are so abundant and so normalized, you know. And so part of what I try to train my younger workers here at the college, my faculty and my staff is, again, take a deep breath, take a deep breath. And yes, maybe you'd like to slap that person, <laughs> but you can't do that. <laughs> you know, you're at the table, the door is open. So know who you are and why are you, why are you there and what are you there to represent? And to your point, Kate, it's really having good information, good data all the time and being able to throw it out there, you know, at, at any given moment and, and whatever, and, and just knowing what that is. You know, it does get tiring. It's exhausting to always have to stand up and, and, and and be forthright about it, but um, it is, it's my job. It's, it's my responsibility as a tribal college president. I'm also the eldest of 14 children. <laughs> and my 91 year old mother likes to point out, well, Cindy, what do you think I'm telling your younger brothers and sisters, although we're older now? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, you have these aha moments in your lifetime both as a person but then as a professional and and how that interplay happens your personal and your professional they cross it, it's you know and so what did your mom and dad what did your grandma and grandpa auntie or uncle teach you about respectful behavior and then using education using those moments in time to educate people here's the truth Here's my story. Here's our story and why you need to be helping us. Here, here. We're going to take a break now. There's one more question, which uh, is worth answering online from Kimberly Scott uh, that re references a recent National Academy report. And I would just say to all of you that those are also available to download for nothing. And the reference is in the Q&A. And so some of you may want to address that question as we're in a break. I want to give our, rapid, our uh, summary, uh, Suzanne, summarizer time to think about the summary. And so let us reconvene at 4.50. And thank you so much to the panelists. And thank you to those of you attending uh, who are still here. We appreciate you. <laughs> See you soon.